Welcome back to this latest episode of Japan's Top Business Interviews. I'm your host, Dr. Greg Story, President, Dale Kani Tokyo Training. My special guest today is David McDonald, who actually has had an amazing career in Japan. And he's uh, just transitioning now. He's been the president of Discovery Japan and his latest iteration here. But we want to hear more about his adventures in Japan as we open up this discussion. David, welcome. And thank you for having me, Greg. I looked through your background. I mean, you've got an amazing background in Japan. I mean, you know, I was a big iMode user back in the day. I thought that was really amazing technology, and you were working in that. Well, and the funny entity, thing is, Dr. now Moran. when I mentioned you know iMode, and that was my first start really in the in in sort of a career here in Japan, uh, almost nobody remembers it yeah. uh, because uh, today's youth, of course, know the iPhone and yeah. forget the i before it. But yeah, uh, yes, yeah. I spent about five years working at Docomo. And, and yeah, you iMode. did, and then you you've gone into media. You've had a number of really mm-hmm. amazing jobs in mm-hmm. media. Over the yeah. years, but um, you, you came here, I guess, originally as a jet. But why Japan? What made you? You're so, a Canadian, uh, but why come to Japan as a jet? Yeah, and and that actually is part of why I think I've stayed so long. Is I, I had no real desire to come j- to Japan. Oh, okay. Uh, and and so the funny story goes that when I graduated from university or college in Canada, I had a, a very good friend who who was desperate to come to Japan, uh, and together we went and applied to the embassy and did all the paperwork and did the the interviews. He unfortunately for the first year was not able to come, uh, but I actually got the you job got to the come. Job. Um, and so I, I came to Japan with almost no bias, um, which is a great way of coming to mm. Japan your first time to really have your eyes mm-hmm. you know, wide open and be able to mm-hmm. think through um, you know what what um, you know what's you know all those dif- differences and understand the differences I guess um, mm-hmm. in, in a better way than coming in with a certain preset mm-hmm. uh, uh, understanding what you think Japan is and mm-hmm. so that's how I got here the first time was just very coincidentally um, through a friend of mine who uh, wanted to come first and then you're out in the middle of nowhere in, <laughs> in Aomori in I mean welcome to Japan David you're going to Aomori it'll yeah. be just like Canada <laughs> yeah well I mean that was also just part of the the, the adventure so um, back in those days you could write I'm probably still now you could write where you wanted to go as a choice and my understanding of Japanese geography was very, very limited. Um, so I said anywhere, uh, and they literally sent me anywhere in this very small town of 10,000 people on the coast of of, uh, of Japan called Fukuoka. And even today, I'm actually the, uh, the 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 tourism ambassador for for Fukuoka, uh, and I get my you know my nengejo, my card in the mail every New Year's Day. Um, and so uh, I spent three years there, uh, and it was a great way to sort of customize uh, and get accustomed to Japan. Uh, uh, from a grassroots perspective. I can't imagine there are too many English speakers up there. Um, in fact, there were none. I mean, there are a few around me, I guess, in the office. And, and of course, my job was to help train them in English. But you know, generally, rather than trying to train uh, 10,000 people in English, I figured it was faster to learn Japanese first. So uh, you know, I spent a lot of my time in the three years I was there just focusing on just learning my own Japanese. And, yeah. and you know, while I, I you, can't so speak fluent... Do you speak Japanese with an Aomori bit? I don't, actually. And, and the funny story is many of my friends who were there at the time do. Um, but and we actually had a, uh, a Tsugaru Ben Taikai, which was a, a, a Benron Taika speech contest that was set up by the local government for uh, for foreigners uh, in Aomori to go do these these speeches. Uh, and it was actually aired on NHK Educational. Um, that's how big it was at the time. Uh, and I used to attend it, but my speeches were never that good. So uh, my, my friends always are much better at, at Tsugaru Ben than I was. <laughs> Amazing. So, you know, uh, you were five years at uh, NTT Dorkman. Yeah. Now, in that time, uh, did you ever get a chance? We talk because this theme is leadership, right? So yeah. we're looking for leadership experiences. Yeah. And uh, I'm just wondering, did you get to a stage where you were actually leading a team inside mm-hmm. NTT or not? Yeah. So, um, you know, Docomo was still a very, well, I think st- is still a very sort of uh, what I call traditional Japanese company. And so the the uh, so. climbing up the ladder uh, at that stage was was very traditional, and so uh, I, I joined, uh, I think, which was a Ipan Shain Sankyu, which was a, whatever it was called at the day, sort of the third level, uh, which was a little bit higher than those who joined from university, had a, a postgrad or a, a master's degree that came in from. Um, and so I, in the five years I was there, I think I finally got up to Ipan Shain Iku, um, but that was not really uh, a big leadership role. Having 
said all that, um, you know, my role was to really work on iMode both here in, in Japan for the first couple of years. And then we, we spent a couple of years, for better or for worse, trying to bring iMode to the world. Um, mm -hmm. So I spent a lot of time in, in France uh, and in uh, the Netherlands and Italy and Greece. And I was a project team manager. Um, okay. So while not necessarily a manager of people in, in sort of a full you know, office setting, um, you know, I would manage three or four people at a time, uh, it, Japanese people at a time, often in places like you know pa Paris for for a project and doing a job there. So yeah. when when you know when there were three iterations in your career and then I think after iMode was it um, Disney Disney it? yeah Disney right yeah. Um, what what stage in your career in Japan did you actually get okay. Yeah, David. Here's so, the team. So you take care of them. Yeah. yeah so it was Disney. Um, Disney was, was my okay. first stage of, of having a more formal formal team. Hey, so you know, you'd been up in Aomori. Mm -hmm. I guess in the in the Kencho was it in the on oh, the actually the the, the, the Yakuba the Yakuba oh even yeah, the Yakuba the, my yeah, God the Yakuba the, the city hall not even city hall the town right hall. the town hall right yeah. the sort of very very remote town hall so you're seeing how bureaucrats are organised yeah. and then you join Docomo mm -hmm. which is a huge company and you know, entity is massive right yeah. three hundred thousand people incredible so you see how they're managed there mm -hmm. so you've had this sort of Japanese perspective on management now you're in charge. And uh, I'm guessing you probably didn't have a management background. Uh, I mean, you spent a little bit of time in military intelligence, yep. I see that, but that's probably a functional role as opposed to a leadership role. So what was your approach to leading a Japanese team and what did you find was a bit challenging? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, at that stage, um, I don't even know if I have anything really to add from those years. And looking back on on my leadership development, you know, I think that team was uh, part um, part international in that you know I had people across the region that reported to me, as well as people here in Japan, uh, and part Japanese. Um, it's almost the last couple of years that Dokomo that helped define better my leadership style that took me into uh, okay. to Disney. Um, believe it or not, um, and and so. Um, you know, I, I, I say, I'd say that um, I was lucky in that my days at Disney were pretty much split down the middle of part pure Japanese and part international or regional, mm -hmm. uh, just because the role I was doing was, was more regional in those days than mm -hmm. it ended up becoming in, in subsequent mm -hmm. jobs, uh, whereas I think my first days at Dokomo were much more local and Japanese. Um, and, and so there I ended up sort of really clinging on to, okay, what's different in the cross-cultural communication mm -hmm. um, between my, my um my team members who are based in Singapore or mm. Taiwan or Australia mm. Mm. Uh, versus the the partners or team members I had here in Japan, mm. right? Um, and, and so that was really the the focus that I, I sort of uh, shifted towards was um, the whole idea of cross cultural cross cultural communication and how do we cross that bridge uh, basically in communication with, within the teams. Um, and that's become sort of my 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 thing ever since, I guess. So what was what was different or mm -hmm. difficult in managing the Japanese team relative to the others? Um, I think this is probably even more highlighted later on in my career when I had bigger teams to manage uh, and even more uh, well, more Japanese and then more foreigner foreigners and non Japanese to to interface with. But um, I, I think part of it was um, as many managers in Japan experienced just a lack of or. Uh, uh, a, a distance um, with the Japanese team uh, in terms of not being able to, seemingly not being able to communicate very well. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not that the ideas are not good, just their ability to actually communicate the ideas mm -hmm. were not, was not good. So we you uh, talking about the ideas from their side. Yes. Coming out with ideas to the boss and we could do this, we could do that type Yeah, of exactly, thing. as mm -hmm. part, part of it. Um, and then uh, sort of a reluctance uh, to change or for change, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, I would see that with just the less so um, with my direct team, but more so with some of the parallel teams in the same you know, Disney group at, mm -hmm. at, at, uh, here in Japan, where they would be even more focused on the Japan business, which until that point had been very successful mm -hmm. uh, with iMode and iMode content and mm -hmm. things like that. And, and as, as the business matured, 
there was a need to do different things, mm -hmm. right? Um, but the team was a little bit more you know, reticent about doing things differently. So mm -hmm. part of it was you know a, a slowness to change mm -hmm. uh, and a bit of a resistance to change. Mm -hmm. uh, and part of it um, was even if they had good ideas, being able to communicate those in a good way mm -hmm. uh, that would get the right investment um, from overseas to really mm -hmm. invest in those I ideas. So yeah, I guess the, the money people are outside the country Generally, and they want yeah. to put projects up and they've got to have a communication capability that's going to persuade those people yep, to exactly. put the money behind it, which exactly. is probably going to be challenging. And after, you went to uh, YouTube, was that next year? Yeah, I went to, to Google and YouTube. Google uh, and YouTube, Or right. Google, Google, at Google doing YouTube, I guess, best way to put it. Yeah, um, right. And I was there for about nine years. Right. Uh, and what was that like leading inside uh, Google YouTube there? Um, that too definitely evolved over the years uh, in that when I began with the business, it was very much a Japanese team. Um, oh, okay. And part of why um, you know, I, I'd been told from my overseas managers why I'd been hired was to bridge the gap, because right. the gap uh, between um, the local team and what the international management wanted to have them do is just too big. Um, mm. And so that was a lot of my time in the first uh, That sounds you know, like a months. lot of heavy lifting. Uh, it, it, was, it was a lot. I mean, I, I didn't do all of YouTube at those days. I mean, my, my, my job was, was threefold uh, when I first joined in 2009. I'm not sure how much you remember of YouTube in, in Japan in 2009, but um, I think the biggest YouTuber in those days was a cat, um, who I think is still with us, uh, living in Yokohama. Um, and I think now has about 500,000 subscribers. In those days, had about 50,000. Um, and so we had no humans on the platform. was the first challenge we had. And the second challenge we had is, you know, we were seen as an illegal site by all the broadcasters. So in, in my team, I had a gentleman whose sole job was, not sole job, was, but one of his big jobs was to go to the fax machine, of course, the fax machine, to go get the takedown messages from the broadcasters each day, to go highlight the, the scan the, uh, the URLs, to go delete those videos. So we had that to manage in one hand. Um, and then the other hand was just, you know, the, the business of YouTube was still uh, very, very nascent. And so, um, you know, the team was an operational team, meaning they were hired to do very operational things mm -hmm. like, you know, how do we get the facts from the scanner? Um, and then all of a sudden the uh, management overseas wanted them to pivot and become a much more business focused team mm -hmm. uh, and a business um, development or even a sales team mm -hmm. um, in terms of getting more uh, YouTubers on the platform mm -hmm. and and I had to really do a lot of work in those days to a get those who are on the team to understand you know the new mission and the new sort of way of thinking and sometimes it means you know, moving people around in, in the company so some mm -hmm. people actually went on to different jobs in Google mm -hmm. and we brought in people to replace them in, in the mm -hmm. in the Google uh, in the mm -hmm. Google verse so, so uh, after after YouTube then it was discovery was the next it was yes yeah, so, and she became yeah. the president of discovery yeah, yeah. so this was your first time as the boss I yeah, guess yeah. and so what was that transition like for you yeah. to go from, okay, you've got a very rich experience in Japan and in different facets, yeah. and all is basically related, yeah. and now you're the boss. So yeah. how did you find that step up? So it was um, exhilarating, I guess. Um, yeah, I had taken on individual leadership roles um, you know, from, this, from really Disney through to Google and YouTube, and at YouTube, I think at the peak of my uh, sort of s scope of management, I had about 50 people I did manage, but it was very much functional folks mm -hmm. that happened to just loosely be under me. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I went to Discovery, uh, I think the, the, the biggest um, well, personal sort of satisfaction was now I was the general manager, which meant I, I had to look after multiple segments yep. from you know content to sales to marketing to mm -hmm. you know whatever, and and only some of the back office functions didn't report in to me directly, and but mm -hmm. rather most of the other functions all reported in to me directly, and so it, it gave me um, a, a real uh, chance to see both the profit and the loss, uh, but also to um, understand sort of the holistic management of the business. So what does mm -hmm. marketing, the marketing lever do to the business? What does mm -hmm. the content lever do to the business? And mm -hmm. then what's the sales levers in mm -hmm. terms of, of mm -hmm. uh, making ad sales as well as mm -hmm. our, our distribution sales to uh, cable TV distributors um, mm -hmm. in, in the market? So um, that, that was a, a fun experience to be across it all, but so then even you... more challenging given the fact that it's got different um, 
much different scale um, yeah. and a lot different. Uh, well, how many people were in Discovery that time? Uh, about uh, 50, 60 at the time. Right. So, so, but not, they're not much so different more, from what you were covering before. Uh, not so the, different, the, but the it was a much more, uh, <coughs> much, it's much, much more, much tighter organization, I'd say, and, and a, a lot more holistic. I think one side, how one piece moved would definitely impact the other piece a, a lot more. Whereas at YouTube, while uh, I managed probably the same amount of people at, at one stage, the 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 way the levers moved. It was um, more siloed. Yeah, it was a bit more siloed, I think. So did you come in with the plan? Did you turn up and say, right, i got to take over. I've just got more well, functional role here, uh, more responsibility p and L. Here's the Here's the 90-day plan, or how did you approach it? Yeah, I, I mean, I... I I, I did come in with a 90 day plan. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think how to phrase it both for the topic of today's conversation, but also just how to phrase it with regards to you know dealing offshore with management. I think both are important lessons. So, um, you know, I, I did come in, you know, very, um, uh, very uh, excited, I guess is a good way of putting it, uh, with a 90 day plan. Is the word uh, gung ho slipping in there anyway? I don't think gung ho would go that far. I mean, I don't think I don't think it was that far, but okay. you know, def- definitely excited. Uh, I think um, you know the um, offshore and our management enjoyed the excitement as well, of course, because they were looking for you know uh, x multiple of, of growth in the market. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Japan's always been a again a big market for discovery in the region, but it could go a lot further. Was mm-hmm. was everyone's thinking? So that's kind of where 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 they looked at the plan. But then okay, start to put some flesh on the bones, as we'd say, right? And 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 make it a bit more uh, uh, achievable. Or what's what's the actual real real details? Um, the Japan team, I remember get, getting them f- together for a very simple one day offsite, um, and. Again, having read all my business, you know, leadership books, I said, okay, we're going to cr- try some, not some games, but some activities, right? And one of them was like, draw, draw, draw how you see the business in five years, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and literally, again, the white piece of paper and some markers, and just this is individually or as a group. Uh, first of all, individually, right, uh, okay. and mm-hmm. and then um, and then the the feedback I got back was. Um, very, um, very, very. Uh, I'm trying to think the right, right word. Right word. It's very. Um, uh, it wasn't very overwhelming. That's what that was. Underwhelming. 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 Uh, underwhelming. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I had driv- in terms of the creativity, or in terms of the scope, or the, scope, the, the, the challenge, scope, or the, the scope and the challenge, ambition. Yeah, scope, challenge, and ambition. I think all right. three of those rolled into one. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, I, I, as a, as a proxy of what my vision was, I said, look, I want to have a theme park. If Disney's got a theme park, <clears throat> and if Universal's got a theme park, we need a theme park, right? Um, and so I had driven this, uh, dr- drawn this safari park with some other pieces of our business mm-hmm. around it, etc. Um, and uh, and that was sort of the beginning and and uh, of the exercise. And and most others, they they were challenged to really think too big and too beyond what's their next step, right? From the from a step up as opposed to a real leap forward, right? Um, and then the second part of the exercise we did was just the scoping of the market. And I said, look, uh, just as a TV company alone, um, if you look at the size of the market and the internet size of the market, which we're also playing in, and other pieces that we're doing, um, if just, you know, 1% gives us Ten dollars a month, you already get uh, X amount, right? Mm. So how do we go make ten dollars a month, right? Mm. To this percentage, right? And, and very simple, kind of brainstorming and, and logic to it, um, which I thought was a good idea at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but they sort of hit a bit of a wall in that mm-hmm. sort of logic in in their mind. And and so while the the presentation upwards to management went well, with the vision and sort of mission. Uh, the presentation or the dragging the team along with me uh, took a long time to kind of mm. cross that bridge really and, mm. and bridge that gap um, over probably I'd say another you know six to, to 12 months of finally getting in the right rhythm of understanding mm. where their mindset was and 
how they're focused more on incremental changes versus you know, knocking out of the park, as we'd say in English, right? For a, mm-hmm. um, you know, a, a, a big, we actually came up with a, uh, the term the big swing project. <laughs> it was the like, big swing project, okay. <laughs> yeah. um, Which was um, one of my, my guys, you know, re- referring to the fact that, you know, our boss wanted a big swing, right? Mm-hmm. And so what, what's, what's that? And so, um, and it never became a big swing after all that probably at the end of the day. But, yeah. Well, I'm sure if you'd asked them to, uh, to critique your uh, safari park, plan they would have been geniuses on that for sure and I find that here too it's I have to keep reminding myself when I put ideas up that the first reaction uh, my team is going to be what's wrong with that idea because I'm looking for how we can take that even further yeah. but so the, the scope gap becomes <clears throat> pretty big pretty quickly and yeah. I keep reminding that's right they're going into negativity first so I have to deal with that yeah and then we can maybe think about going forward so I, I appreciate that Thank you. so uh, thinking back you know yeah um, how did you how did you, or what did you find worked well for getting the teams engaged? You've had a number of different iterations here mm-hmm. in different companies, different teams, but generally speaking, people are people. And so mm-hmm. getting people behind the, the goals, getting them the targets to go and get the targets mm-hmm. or the thing, you know, about the business. And what did you find worked well to get people engaged? Yeah. Um, I think this was probably less so at. Disney, although also worked there and definitely worked at, at even even iMode or, or Docomo. But um, I think people need a certain level of passion passion in what what we're trying to present and get mm-hmm. them to, to get on board. And, and, and so does that imply they should have the passion when they're employed? Or are we talking about we're going to construct passion in them? What are we talking about here? Um, I think there's two elements, like when I interview somebody uh, or we assess them for the fit into the company, I mean, that's one thing I always look for is how much do we think they'll be energized by what we want to do, right? Um, it's always difficult to, to judge that in an interview because yeah. someone can put on a, a, a great face. Put on a happy face, and, right? And, and, yeah. and not quite, you know, come out later on. But I think as a leader, um, you know, I'm, I'm very focused on um, – on storytelling as right. a way to uh, to energize you know different team members and and that sort of thing. But just, just talk about that a bit more yeah. because you know um, we throw these these cool buzzwords around like storytelling. You know, we throw and we grab grab band and but what do we actually mean by that? You know, yeah. because I think for a lot of people when they hear that, oh yeah, storytelling. They got no actual idea mm-hmm. what we're talking about. So, mm-hmm. in your mind, yeah. when you talk about storytelling, the importance of storytelling, what are you actually talking about? Yeah. So, um, g- generally, when I talk about storytelling uh, and when I tell a story, mm-hmm. usually I try and anchor it on something that's really real to me and the audience, mm-hmm. right? Uh, preferably a real story that's mm-hmm. happened to me or will happen mm-hmm. to me mm-hmm. and potentially to them as mm-hmm. as, as the audience. Um, so, um, and that to me is um, a good way of anchoring the the message uh, mm-hmm. in order to try and get some um, some uh, call to action or call to, to get them to an act to a, to a call to action. Um, I, I'd say the, the next piece of it is, um, you know, T- telling a story, uh, and, and maybe this is because I've been in the entertainment space for so long, um, leveraging sort of all of the the um, the practical and sort of edu- the academic ways of telling a, a story mm-hmm. and the arc uh, and the arc and which is different, and, which is different yeah. from you know in Asia versus the U.S. Right mm-hmm. again, and so depending on the audience, you need to adjust that. You know, there's less conflict in a Japanese story versus mm-hmm. or an Asian uh, an East Asian story versus uh, say a U.S. Hollywood type story, and mm-hmm. so. Um, so how do you sort of uh, adjust the story to get people really motivated mm-hmm. uh, and really um, buy into it, right? But so then anchored on, uh, but anchored on something that's a, a personal story or one that they'll relate to that, oh, they can see themselves in that story as well. Um, so just picking up that point when you talk about that, that differentiation between sort of Hollywood and, and East Asia, you know, I'm just thinking there in terms of from a business point of view where maybe I'll be a bit uh, exaggerating a bit here yeah. perhaps, but... Maybe in a, in a Western context, the narrative of the story might be, 
oh, wow, it's going to be a disaster. We don't hit those PL numbers and we've got to really come up with this project. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's all going to be doom and gloom. It's going to be crash and burn. It's going to be train wreck. And it's that sort of hyped up tension mm-hmm. around failure and therefore motivating everyone to be successful. Yep. So in a, a Japanese context, what would the, in a business context, what would the storyline be yeah. that would motivate people if you're not going that sort of train wreck route? Yeah, so um, it would probably be, and again, I'm not as much of an expert as I want to be in this space, but you know, it would probably be um, something more along the lines of um, less doom and gloom and more sort of, and less conflict, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Still, still an element of conflict, but mm-hmm. one of the areas that um, you know usually there's a, a, a hero or a hero's journey mm-hmm. in in uh, a lot of mythology mm-hmm. or or Western storytelling mm-hmm. uh, in Japan or in East Asia, to, to, for the most part, uh, there's much more of a, a nakama or a group, mm-hmm. right, um, mm-hmm. that is on a journey, mm-hmm. right, um, and that's that's I think the difference from a, you know from a Japanese or uh, East Asian perspective and telling a story in a business situation compared mm. to, uh, you know, how do you, you know, take that idea in a Western situation, which is mm. about usually an individual. Yep. I think here, especially, you know, the the, the idea of Nakam or team or, mm. or, or the group, I think is that's a- applicable in the storytelling sense. But again, back into the business sense, very much applicable there, right? The, the, mm. So how do you bring that idea back to, you know, you the individual um, as you tell the story, but also you mm. the nakama as as you mm. go. So we on switch from I to we. Yeah, is probably a big split, isn't it, across the two divides? Exactly. Yeah. Or the yeah. D divide, I should yeah. say. Great. So yeah, well, please keep going. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, in terms of engaging people, yeah. I mean, you know, we're talking. Um, off sites, we're talking boozy dinners, are we talking, you know, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, trips away? I, are we, what I, are we talking I've, about? I've actually, I've actually found that, um, especially with the last three years of Corona, the, the, the need for boozy dinners and, and off sites is less and less, although mm-hmm. I think there is a, a, a place for those. Um, and I think um, there is, um, there is nothing. I was a very strong uh, proponent of of working from home, and mm-hmm. I really enjoyed it for the first eighteen months. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then since, you know, while I like the the flexibility, um, I do think that you know having a in person conversation, in person mm-hmm. uh, you know, interaction is very important. So, so did you bring everyone back into the office after eighteen months, or yeah, did you let I, them play at home? Or? I mean, we, we've we've kind of a hybrid so mm-hmm. you know we've asked them to come back but not really enforcing it if you can okay. put it that way okay. um and uh you know i think the company given that we're a creative company at mm-hmm. heart um mm-hmm. you know either as discovery or now with the merger with warner mm-hmm. um you know we i think we, we do better together right mm-hmm. as opposed to uh mm-hmm. being apart in those situations and so mm-hmm. like i was talking to the creative team a couple of weeks ago and they were saying that just you know it's not they they couldn't do over Zoom the creative meetings, mm-hmm. but it's just so much easier, faster, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and um, you know simpler when they're in a room together to be able to do do a creative meeting and mm-hmm. go through a storyboard or it might mm-hmm. be. So. If you want to be successful as a leader, do the leadership training for managers course. All companies need people who can both manage and lead. Leading people screams out for real skills in communication, dealing with all different types of people. Being excellent at innovation, planning, delegation, handling mistakes, doing performance reviews really well, and inspiring and motivating the team. Do the Leadership Training for Managers course now in either Japanese or English. Are you doing business with Japan? Do you really know how things work? Japan Business Mastery provides the answers. Do you have the right networks and know how to create them? Do you know how to get on the same wavelength with Japanese buyers? Do you know what being trustworthy looks like from the Japanese perspective? Japan Business Mastery is based on more than 30 years experience in Japan and will become your go-to guide. Want to succeed in Japan? Buy Japan Business Mastery now. 
So one of the uh, one of the paths to creativity and innovation is to have an engaged team because, yeah. you know, uh, I don't care about the company. So whether the mousetrap improves or not is not my business as a sort of non-engaged attitude, as opposed to you know well, how can we improve this mousetrap? You know, yeah. so uh, presuming you've got the engaged team, um, and I'm not talking about uh, <coughs> sort of R and D people necessarily, mm-hmm. or the uh, sort of you know. Um, black turtleneck and uh, and ponytail, uh, you know, beret-wearing creatives. I'm yeah. not talking about people who are very specialised yeah. in creativity. I'm not talking about that group. I'm talking about the, the general run mm-hmm. of team members. So, you know, every company has got places you can speed things up, slow things down, save money, spend money, mm-hmm. expand, contract, you know, amplify, uh, you know, reduce. So what we found has worked well to get the team in general, mm-hmm. people in general, uh, thinking more innovatively or being more creative, did you come up with some creative methods around brainstorming or any particular techniques that work for you, anything like that? I'm not sure if I can say any of these really worked, but I, I will say that um, while it did take a lot of... Um, I don't know if change management is the right word. Um, we We started to become far more inclusive as an organization um, mm. over the last, e- even with the pandemic, or maybe in spite of the pandemic might be a way of putting it. So mm. when What I, does that mean, though, we became well, more inclusive? Well, when I first joined the company as Discovery, um, there were, you know, I mentioned that there's sort of the, the three basic teams that report directly into me, the content, the marketing, and the, the, the revenue or the sales team. Um, and each of them worked fairly independently and there's a little bit of tension between each Mm -hmm. which if it's good tension is good um, especially between content and and sales and others Mm -hmm. but when it's kind of bad tension is bad Mm -hmm. right Um, and so um, a lot of what I spent a lot of my time on was engaging not so much with the leaders of those teams although I Mm -hmm. did with them as well but rather their team members and so I would spend Mm -hmm. a lot of time um, I'd have an office hours we used to do at Google as a thing. Um, so every week on Thursdays between you know, that one and two o'clock, my door is open. If you mm. want to come and sign up for that, like mm-hmm. a like a like a professor at a college, mm-hmm. uh, you you could. Um, and that's where I would sort of gather uh, information and, and insights on you know where things are not quite working you know between management or the next mm-hmm. level of management. And so with that insight. And this, ha- this happened literally around the time that, well, just before Corona, I guess. But um, we, uh, I, I, I really sort of ended up having to um, be much more active in creating a, a, a more cohesive leadership team, mm-hmm. including offsites and mm-hmm. doing a lot of, you know. Uh, exercises around you know understanding each other's personality etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm-hmm. did you do things like disc or these sorts of strength finders or something like that yeah strength finders but also each other better? yeah strength finders as well as um not so much strength finders we did a lot of like uh um we started off with because we needed to break down why people didn't like the other people per person, right? So mm-hmm. there's a lot of, of tension like that. Mm-hmm. And so we started off with, you know, your own personal story and how that impacts you and that sort of thing as a way mm-hmm. of, of getting people to open up a bit more and start to mm-hmm. see, oh, that person's actually a human, right? right. Um, and so, you, so weren't, you weren't doing the classic Western thing, which is, Okay, Tanaka and Suzuki, come in here. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna butt heads and work this conflict out. It wasn't that type of typical Western n- approach, right? N- no, and and uh, well, no and yes, because at the end of the day, we did an offsite, which was I, I felt very Westernized as well. Mm. Um, but once that was done, I actually then included the next level leadership in the in the mm-hmm. leadership meetings. So not just the top three, right. but rather their next level as right. well. Well, the point I was getting at is, yeah. you know, if you've got people, um, like if you're if you're trying not to bring conflict out into the open mm-hmm. and say, okay, we're all going to sit here and hear why Suzuki and Tanaka are yeah. not getting it. now. Talk up. What's the problem between you two? What is the issue? Yeah, that's one approach, right? What I'm hearing you saying is that it was more like. 
we hear the Tanaka narrative and we hear yeah. the Suzuki narrative yeah. and we realize, oh, Tanaka grew up in a single mother family yeah. and yeah, was yeah, poor exactly. as church mice and, you know, had a terminal hard life and da 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 and, you know, beaten by his father or something, whatever it might be, you know. And then you have more empathy when yeah, you hear that from exactly, someone. So yeah. you tend to be a bit more forgiving yeah. when there's a bit of burr under the saddle tension e- there. Exactly. Yeah. So it was more that style. Exactly. Of thing. Right. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Exactly. Thank you. Um, and, and that I found that worked again as a trigger to uh, just cascade down through the the team members to the mm-hmm. next layer of management as well, and then down to the individual members on the floor. Right. So, um, but it all started with me basically having to spend a lot of time with each individual member to sort of hear better what their each individual mm-hmm. concerns were and mm-hmm. sort of making the time for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and for most of the employees or the team members, that was just shocking that I would spend time with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'd have them you know, ha- literally in open office hours that you know, had you know 20 minute blocks yep. and they could yep. sign up for, for that. Yep. And we used to do it at Google all the time as a, as a, as a me- method, but mm-hmm. uh, they were just surprised that I was that open and that, that mm-hmm. sort of, uh, um, and, and so that, that was part of what I enjoyed doing you know, to keep the team open was that sort of direct communication with the team level. Was there any, um I mean, how did you do that? Because normally in any sort of hierarchical structure, the boss of that section is not comfortable for the big boss to be going around them to the people underneath them because mm-hmm. they become paranoid about mm-hmm. what, what will they say about me? What are they talking about? You mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. how am I going to look? So how did you sort of get around that fear that they have around you going past them to the people below them? I, I think... I took an approach of just being open and honest with them too. And mm-hmm. while I'd always keep confidentiality with whomever said mm-hmm. you know, whatever to me in that session mm-hmm. with, a, with someone from the, the, the main team, mm-hmm. um, I would feedback, you know, um, uh, sort of, uh, I'd feedback information or feedback, feedback to them, right? Uh, in order to understand what was being said. So I, I mm-hmm. never kept secrets, mm-hmm. and, but it was always confidential, if you know right. what I mean. I know what you um, mean. And, and I think through that, they all felt that um, they were, it's almost that level they were less concerned with than their peers. Right. <laughs> what their peers are saying about them versus right. their employees, if that can make right. sense. Yep. Uh, and and so, you know, but in both cases, I was just had a very open and honest, uh, mm-hmm. you know, approach to try mm-hmm. and deal with both. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, coming back to uh, the, uh, the creativity part, right? So um, anything else you found useful to get creativity from the team? Um, For better or for worse, um, even though we're a we were a big uh, you know U.S. owned operation, um, I tried to keep enough uh, flexibility and freedom for the teams themselves to experiment and make mistakes, um, okay. and and so um, and we were able to I think even though the team was ninety five percent Japanese. Um, with our recruiting, we were able to find a team that were pretty much not all, but a good 60% willing to make mistakes. That's interesting because, you know, we, we have this no defect, no mistake culture in Japan. Yeah. In fact, one of my, my previous guests, Carl Hane, made an amazing comment, which I hadn't thought about until he said it, that, you know, he asked me, what's the, what's the, um, uh, what's the result of failure? in companies and whatever, and, and uh, or traditionally. And I said, oh, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he said, no, it's suicide. <clears throat> because in the samurai culture, in the traditional culture, if you failed your lord, your accountability for that was, you know, ripping your, your insides out yeah. with a rather sharp knife. Yeah. And I hadn't thought about that. And mm. he said, well, you know, if this is a sort of cultural norm, Mm-hmm. Um, don't be surprised if people are pretty worried about making a mistake. Yeah. And so, you know, trying to, as you have rightly pointed out, 
uh, creativity has a rather messy mm. uh, nature to it. And so it doesn't go beautifully and it doesn't go you know, uh, succinctly or it doesn't yeah. go uh, strategically, um, sequentially. It, it's all over the place mm-hmm. and there are mistakes. So how did you encourage people to have that, um, overcome that fear mm-hmm. of uh, making mistakes and actually try and experiment and be willing to, to fail? Well, again, first of all, at the recruiting stage or level, we, I'd have to go think more about how to answer this, but we seem to be able to get a lot of people who, more, more people than usual, who mm-hmm. were more willing to take, take those mm-hmm. risks. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd have to think about how um, for another podcast another day, All but right. let's, we'll fast forward we'll to the, let's fast forward to the next one, which is, okay, then how do we let them take those mistakes? And I think the, the first thing was, um, you know, the company just broadly, um, you know, we're a U.S.-based entertainment company that unless you lose billions of dollars, um, which is not unheard of, but unless you lose billions of dollars, uh, there's generally not a lot of, uh, of, of sort of, you know, doing the seppuku on the on the front steps of the building, right? Mm. Um, and so the risks people were able to take were not of the, you know, millions of dollars. It was more not in cataclysmic. The, yeah, the the, mm. the tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars of range, and you know, I was able to give a little bit of oversight, so I, I'd be able to s- spot the ones that probably weren't going to make it, and therefore maybe give them a bit of a push one way or another. Mm-hmm. Um, and even those that weren't going to make it, um, giving it, it enough of a try um, for the individuals to kind of play with it and understand what's working or not working. Mm. Um, and, and I think that's something that, um, you know, I, I hope as I leave Discovery that, you know, here in Japan, that the team can keep, keep going because mm-hmm. I think that's, that's their, their secret sauce that mm-hmm. whether it be, um, and we went through some pretty, you know, just the business model of cable TV um, is, uh, you know, the cable company pays a lot of money um, to distribute the channels. But we went to a model where we said, look, we can't get any more money from cable TV or not much money more from cable TV. Um, so we need to also look at digital. Mm-hmm. But that really is not making the cable TV providers happy. No, so, you're competing with them. Exactly. And so, you know, uh, early on in my sort of five years there, I made the call that, okay, we're going to double down on YouTube. I'd used YouTube for nine years before. And I had a, a woman that worked with me um, who actually is now at Pinterest here in Japan. Um, and um, she had worked with me at YouTube. Um, and so uh, I said to her, look, Ali, uh, just go do it. Um, and I'll close my eyes for six months to see how it goes. And we were able to get, you know, within a couple of years, another 10 million viewers just through YouTube that wow. would not have been through cable TV, right? Wow. We only had, a, I can't say the numbers, but, you know, yeah. on, on YouTube yeah. is open, so I can. Yeah. Um, but uh, so with that in mind, I think I think just taking some, some risks like that, but then following through and trying to fly cover, so to speak, um, mm. both with the partners, but in that case, a little bit with, with management as well. Mm. Um, but the results proved out, and that was good. And, and but at the same time, within that same sphere of doing YouTube stuff, we tried some shows that didn't work, and mm. we did some other things that didn't work. But you know, mm. we tried it, gave it two or three months to run, and if it didn't work, we shut it down, and we mm. didn't lose that much money. So mm. I think giving some people some some chance to do that. Mm. Um, but again, I, I just I have to come back in another podcast another day around okay, how do we recruit for that um, yeah. specifically in Japan? Because yeah. that was I think a great function of the team a lot of people were just were just willing to do that right um, I think also you know it's uh, it's part of the uh, onboarding process that you know you tell people uh, this is an environment it's a safe psychologically safe environment yep. where you're allowed to fail in the course of trying to have innovation mm-hmm. failure based around simple errors, mm-hmm. um, silly mistakes, lack of attention, that's a separate category. Yep. But for innovation, we're flexible here and you can try stuff and fail because we'll learn in the process. Yep. You know? So having that conversation at the beginning, I imagine, would, would set the sort of tone for where we're going. Yep. Thinking about people of change, mm-hmm. uh, in getting more uh, comfortable with mm-hmm. risk, you yep. 
Do you have a particular a guy in mind? Yeah. So yeah, I, I was I was uh, thinking about somebody who um, you yeah, worked with for five years in this role, and uh, he he's a gentleman who heads up our our, our revenue and and uh, and ad sales section, and he. Um, comes from a background is in a, a fairly large um, ad, ad firm here in Japan. Uh, he came to Discovery about a year before I did. Uh, and when I first met him, I was a little bit, I wasn't quite sure if I'd be able to, to keep him around, let's put it that mm. way. He, was, he seemed very uh, reluctant to change, mm -hmm. uh, seemed a little bit kind of set in his ways. Mm -hmm. uh, he was confrontational in a good way so we'd be mm -hmm. able to banter and be mm -hmm. able to, to do things a little bit differently that way um, but I was saying to him just last week uh, I think he's probably changed the most of the five people of the, mm -hmm. in the five years I've worked there mm -hmm. um, and I'm very happy because I think he's become uh, much more of, as a leader able to provide a psychologically safe uh, environment for his own team oh, um, okay. and to be able to take more risk himself too. Mm, so it's actually mm. been able to do a little bit of both. Um, I think some of his team still was scared of him, but, uh, <laughs> but, but for the most part, he's done a good job and, and, uh, yeah. and really had a good uh, transformation. So that's made me feel pretty good about the last that's great. few years. And what about culture? You know, mm. because uh, you've had experience of a number of different organizational cultures in your Years here in Japan, and all Japan in total. How many years in Japan? Twenty-eight. Next twenty-eight, year, right? So yeah. those twenty-eight years, you've experienced a number of different cultures. What have you found works well to build a culture in a company? Because yeah. you've got the sort of headquarter culture, mm -hmm. HQ culture, and then you've got Japan culture for the country, and then you've got the headquarters representative organization in Japan. Yep. And there's going to be a certain culture to that. What have you found works well to build culture? Yeah. Uh, and I am not at all perfect at this, um, although I would like to think I, I could be. Um, you know, I think um, the one thing that, and I was saying this earlier on about my first experience in Japan and sort of being very unbiased about my, my first exposure um, to Japanese culture, um, you know, I think the thing that drives me crazy about both headquarters and the local team is on one hand the headquarters team will say oh they're too quiet or they don't put their hands up in the meetings or we do these town halls and and there's like crickets from the japan team or whatever it might be and that's re religiously the, the same feedback um and then the J japan team just looks up at headquarters and says well yeah but this is yeah but this is japan uh, or th this is japan but Da, 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 right, so, um, and that's religious too in terms of their feedback that it's just two different you know, cultures. And so um, I think there needs to be on both sides a lot of introspection first um, and understanding um, for the Japanese team to understand themselves but then how they're seen by headquarters. Mm -hmm. um, and then for headquarters to also understand how the Japan team sees them, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had a, another case couple of weeks ago where had some executives in town and we're trying to do a negotiation and you know it was it was um, you know the the reaction is well, we, we've got our top you know decision makers here in the room if they bring their decision makers we can decide it all right now this week can we, can we go home right yeah no and, problem and, and, and I, I said well yeah but they need 12,000 decision makers <laughs> because of the way they do their nemoashi or the way yeah. they're buying the roots or whatever yeah. you want to call it right uh, uh, socialization so um, that understanding before really butting heads is really important so um, mm. a lot of what I've tried to do again, for better or for worse, is find those frameworks, find those ways of trying to mm. explain those differences better, mm. um, help uh, you know, be a, a, uh, an advocate for, for, for one and the other, as mm. opposed to one or the other, mm. um, and then try and figure out how to bring those together mm. closer. Um, mm. you know, again, the plug, I did a, a course this year, I guess, at uh, INSEAD um, by a... Uh, uh, led by a, a professor called Aaron Meyer has a book called The Culture Map mm -hmm. uh, that I strongly recommend about just looking at she's got about two, 20, 200,000 points of data for different individuals on where they fit on a number of different axes for you know um, or dimensions for, for culture uh, and it is fascinating understanding where does the Japanese fit against you know either the UK or Australia or mm -hmm. whoever it might be 
Um, and so helping to kind of map those out, first of all, and understanding where the gaps and differences mm -hmm. are, mm -hmm. um, and then trying to explain to one and the other mm -hmm. you know, where the gaps are and trying mm -hmm. to fill the gap is kind of mm -hmm. how I've, I've done it really for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, and that's from the, the cross-cultural piece. From the local piece, um, yeah, I always say to the, the I've always said to the the Discovery Japan team is, mm -hmm. you know, we're um, we're not a Japanese company. Mm -hmm. We're not really an international company. We're a global company in Japan, mm -hmm. uh, and so if we don't leverage uh, a the fact we're in Japan, how we can maximize that, but also the fact we're a global company, mm -hmm. uh, then we're never going to be as a TV broadcaster, as say Fuji or mm -hmm. uh, you know Nitere or whoever it might be, right? Mm -hmm. So, so, um, so I, I've always sort of tried to focus on. Trying to bring in those those mixed cultural aspects mm -hmm. to the team, but then from then from a base cultural perspective, trying to mix mix two together. Mm. And if you're going to give some advice to someone who's being sent to Japan to run the operation, okay, yeah. you know, go to Japan, take over, run it. What would be some advice you'd give them? First, um, try and it's it's difficult. And I was very lucky when I first came because I accidentally got here. But try and, and wipe your perceptions of what you think Japan is mm -hmm. clean from your memory mm -hmm. when you come. So you experience everything afresh, mm -hmm. right? So that's my first first thing. Um, actually, there's, there's, I'm just going to quote something that I saw the other day, mm. actually in a TED Talk. Uh, and... I'm afraid I don't have the gentleman's name, so I need to get that. I'll, I'll get it to you maybe for the notes. But you know, when you come to a new culture, you can you can uh, confront it, you can complain about it, or you can conform to it. Hmm. Um, and I thought it was an interesting. Confront, complain, or conform. Yeah, and hmm, interesting. And in um, in confronting it, you end up. Um, Hang on, get the right ones here. Confirming it, um, you're able, you're actually not really doing the right thing, mm -hmm. right? By conforming to it, you become a, a cultural chameleon. So mm -hmm. basically, you're able to blend in. Mm -hmm. And by complaining about it, basically, you get into isolation. You mm -hmm. end up going to the bars in Rapunki and mm -hmm. you don't really associate mm -hmm. with anybody else other mm -hmm. than your other expats, right? Mm -hmm. So I thought that was an interesting thing. You know, beyond the unbiased, um, you know, try to keep those three words, uh, and I'll get that for the the podcast mm -hmm. notes later for you mm -hmm. to make sure I Thank get you. the right people. But it's complain, uh, conform, or confront. Yeah. Uh, you can choose which C to take, and uh, and conforming, not not in a robotic and sort of like shave your head religious way, but uh, you know I think um, understanding more of the culture. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's what's worked for me. Mm. Um, you've you learned to work in the milieu of Japan yeah culture. I mean mm. I, like I've gone to like every meeting that I do with um, a Japanese CEO or an executive or I do a dinner with them or it might be I'm always surprised um, at how comfortable they end up being with me mm. because I spent three years in Aomori and mm. because I speak you know, enough Japanese mm -hmm. and um, and because I've tried to conform to the the culture mm -hmm. more than complain or more than and believe me I don't I get some of my own complaints <laughs> but, but uh, um, I mean think that that's just been my my experience so I recommend mm. that. What other advice would you have someone who's coming in here? Um, have some mentors mm -hmm. and have some. Um, Coaches or mentors, right? Um, I, I think they could be within the company. Don't have mm -hmm. to be necessarily professional coaches or mentors outside of the company. But um, you know, I, I've never really had them myself per se. Mm -hmm. um, at least in the foreign community, I've had mm -hmm. some in in the Japanese business community who've helped to be sort of kind of business mentors and coaches over the years, and mm -hmm. and they tend to be a little bit international, so it's mm -hmm. it's helped out. But mm -hmm. um, so I think having a, a 
you know, a coach or two or a mentor or two you can go have a beer with and understand, mm -hmm. okay, here's, I've got the situation. What mm -hmm. do I do with it? Mm -hmm. um, what do you think? I think, and that, that could be helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, and that could be in the, the company as well. If you have mm -hmm. someone here, you're, you're mm -hmm. a trusted advisor. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Um, no, I, I mean, it goes back a little bit to, uh, what I was saying before in the question about and the, the topic about sort of building a culture, uh, just spending some time to understand what on a number of dimensions where the culture today f sits. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm a big um, student of history. So my undergraduate mm -hmm. is also in history and I've, I read a lot of history and mm -hmm. all that. So I, I really enjoy getting into trying to figure the reason why mm -hmm. this type of cultural aspect or cultural um, culture is, is, is predominant in Japan mm -hmm. relative to some, somewhere else in, in East mm -hmm. Asia or elsewhere in Asia. Um, and so while I'm not um, necessarily recommending everyone become a, a, a his, historian or an a anthropologist, I think you're know, having a little bit of insight mm -hmm. about, okay, why is it this way? And... Um, you know, understanding the cultural differences based on certain dimensions, mm -hmm. I think, helps. Mm -hmm. um, and that can really help, I think, just with everyday, you know, life mm -hmm. um, as much as, as uh, yeah. working in the, in the office. Should they learn Japanese? I, I'm not sure if it's 100% needed. Mm -hmm. um, I mean... If you're only here for a two or three year stint, I think, yep. you know, um, having the basics doesn't hurt. Mm -hmm. But I've had in the past, like I had a, a, a very good um, friend and boss at Disney um, who you know, spoke a reasonable amount of Japanese, but he wasn't at all fluent. Mm -hmm. But he was able to perform and operate very well in Japanese culture with the, within our own internal team, mm -hmm. as well as with partners, right? So mm -hmm. uh, when I think of his um, performance, for example, I, I, I would say it's not necessar necessarily like 100% mm -hmm. you know, necessary, um, but uh, it does help uh, mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and it makes the, the, the drinking party is far easier to <laughs> communicate. Yeah. What about your definition of leadership? So I'm going to paraphrase this. So, uh, and I, again, I'll get this for your notes later on because I can't remember the name of the Brigadier General. But I, when I was a kid, I was, I was an air cadet. Um, and so I took a leadership course in one summer. And the, the definition of leadership we learned then was, paraphrasing, was uh, to... Um, Get people to do stuff because they want to do it because you want them to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, a combination of you know they want to do it too. Yep. You want to do want, want them to do it, um, and so getting them to do it is is mm -hmm. is the, the the goal of leadership. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll get the proper quote and and uh, and uh, who said it later. Yeah. <laughs> Any other final points on leadership in Japan we haven't covered? No, I, I think just m my final word would be, um, you know, I'm coming from 28 years here, and it is, it is a fabulous place with a number of very strong homegrown leaders mm -hmm. and a lot of strong leaders who come to Japan and have made it, you know, home and, 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 and uh, are, are good leaders here as well. It often gets... I think more recently than not, given the uh, economic troubles um, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, not exactly the the fastest economy right now, a little bit of a, a downplay. Um, but I think with the right leadership and the right uh, next generation as well involved in leadership for the for the country and for business here in the country, I think. Um, there's lots of opportunity um, mm -hmm. that uh, I think has been untapped um, mm -hmm. over the last 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. It might take a while to get it mm -hmm. re-going again, 
um, but I'm quite happy that I'm here, uh, and I'm quite happy I made mm. you know, Japan my, my, my country of choice and my country for business and, and leadership. Mm. So, uh, so hopefully others will do the same. Well, I'm sure they will. And David, thank you. It's thank been you. great. Yeah, thank great. you very much. Thank you. So join us again for our next episode of Japan's top business interviews.